Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you'd like to open them up to uh, Romans chapter 8. I thought we were done. There we go. (laughs) Romans chapter 8, and uh, and we're going to be covering uh, the last part of chapter 8, verses 30 through 39. And so I've been preaching the sermon series that I'm calling Identity in Christ. And it just so happens there's a resurrection resurrection message right here at the very end of Romans chapter 8. And uh, this is who our identity is. I've been talking, each, each message is about who our identity is in Jesus Christ. And uh, this one is about is God is on our side. That is a fact. If we are in God's family, we are in his everlasting love. He is always on our side. Even though that you don't even realize that, he is on your side. He's on your side this morning. And so uh, when I think about that, I think about, Uh, when it comes to like an election uh, in our country. Now, during election time, you listen to a lot of like rhetoric and propaganda from different candidates, you know, that that want you to vote for them. And so if you listen to one side's rhetoric and propaganda and what they say about the other person, it's like, wow, that person seems like a scumbag. It doesn't seem like they're for me at all. It seems like they're like against me trying to get my money and still my freedom, whatever the case may be. But then if you listen to the other side, talk about, you know, the other person, you know, their propaganda and everything, their rhetoric, it's like, well, that person's a scumbag. You know, they're not very good. They're against me and and things like that. And it just kind of muddies up the waters when you listen to all this rhetoric and propaganda. And by the way, we're not a political church, just so you know. Uh, you know, we, we never endorse a candidate or anything like that. We're kingdom focused is what this church is. But I think about that when it comes to our passage this morning, but because he talks about the rhetoric and the propaganda of our enemy. And the enemy would like to convince us, he talks about in the passage, that God is not for us, that he's actually against us. But we're going to look at these different things here uh, this morning in the passage that show us otherwise it's actually truth. It's not rhetoric. It's actually truth that God is for us. And he proves that he is for us. He proves that he loves us, how much he loves us. We're going to look at that. You know, the rhetoric of the devil is very real. I don't know if it's very real in your life. It's very real in my life. Trying to convince us that God is not actually for us. That God is actually trying to like fight against us. And some of the rhetoric goes like this. God doesn't really love you. I mean, why do you think that God loves you? I mean, look at these trials that you're going through. Look at this rough time that you're going through, this hardship. This shows that God really doesn't love you. Look at all these people dying in the world. If he was a loving God, why wouldn't he help them? I mean, this is some of the devil's rhetoric. And there's a lot more rhetoric, you know, that goes on in in, in our minds, our hearts, trying to convince us that God is not on our side. But if you look at the proof of his love, what he did for us, by, as we just sang about, giving his own son and dying for us, And all the other things that we're going to talk about this morning, it's like, wait a minute, God is for me. And I mean, he he is on my side and he he wants good things for my life. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. So, So what I have for you this morning, I have seven different points that proves God is on our side. It proves his love for us. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk us through the passage and I'm just going to go in order all of these things that proves that God is for us and not against us. So the first one is, I'm sorry, let me go ahead and read, the, read this passage right here, this couple of verses right here. He says, um, let me start in verse 31. He says, what then shall we say to these things? What are we going to say to these things? All the things in the previous verse right here, what we talked about last week, that God is actually working behind the scenes on your behalf. Good things. Now, sometimes we don't realize that because we're in suffering, but actually suffering is sometimes God's design for our life. We talked about that that last week because sometimes God is like trying to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ through the suffering that we go through. But God is working on your behalf behind the scenes of your life, and all things are working out for your good. 
for those that, that love God. We looked at that last night, la, uh, last Sunday. And we're predestined, we're called, we're justified, and we're glorified up in heaven. I mean, what shall we say to these things? And then he says, if God be for us, who can be against us? It's like, can, can you know, the devil defeat God? No. Can, can some enemy defeat God in your life? No. I mean, you fill in the blank. There's something playing up here. Somebody's got some pretty music going. Uh, you fill in the blank. Is there, is there something in your life that can defeat God? The answer is no. Nobody is stronger than God. It's kind of like the argument of, you know, my daddy's stronger than your daddy, right? You know, my daddy can pick your daddy's truck up. How about that? Oh, no, my daddy can pick your daddy's truck up and your mom's car up at the same time. No, no, my daddy's even stronger than that. He can pick up a train. Well, how about my daddy spoke the universe into existence. That kind of ends the argument, right? I mean, our daddy is the strongest daddy out of any daddy ever. I mean, no one can defeat our... And if he's on our side, and that's the thing we're going to look at this morning, we're not convinced that he is actually on our side. And so let me give you these seven things that show us God is on our side. He proves that. So the first one is, number one, he forsook his own son for us. So in uh, Romans 8, verse 32, he says, he who do not, did not spare his own son, he didn't spare his own son. The father didn't. Now, now get this, Jesus was on the cross, okay? He was hanging on the cross. And his very last words that he said was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As he hung on the cross, silence. The father didn't say anything. God had forsaken his own precious son on the cross. He proved that he loves us by forsaking the most precious relationship that he's had for all of eternity on the cross. Now, I don't know about you. If you're a, a parent, I'm a father of children. And if, if my child was suffering and in pain, and they said, Dad, how come you're forsaking me? My instinct was, would be to step up and say, okay, I'm going to protect you. Whatever situation you're in, I'm going to give my life. I'm in protection. The father didn't do that for his son. And the reason why he didn't do it, we can answer the question is, he did it for us. He forsook his precious son for us. That proves God loves us and he's on our side. You know, the rhetoric of the enemy will say, God doesn't love you. Why, why would you think God loves you? Because he gave his only son. I mean, that proves his love. Number two, he gives us grace and mercy blessings. Because he continues to say, uh, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I like that word free, freely. That means you don't earn it. And, uh, you know, these are two very important words in your walk with the Lord and in Christianity. Grace and mercy. And it's really important that you understand what these words mean in your life because gra the word grace means gift, right? It's just like on your birthday. When someone gives you uh, a birthday gift, you don't say, well, thank you. I earned that, didn't I? No, you say, well, thanks, you know, for I didn't do anything for it. It was, it was a gift. That's what grace is. And mercy is getting something that you don't deserve, as in the bad things that you do deserve. I mean, just like when, if you're driving down the road and, and you're speeding going down the highway and a highway patrolman pulls you over and, and you roll down the window and, and uh, he says, you've been speeding, I'm going to give you a ticket. You don't, you don't tell the officer, say, I want justice. No, you want mercy. Please don't give me what I deserve, a ticket. That's what mercy is. God freely gives us grace and mercy in our life. I mean, he, he gives us these blessings. In Hebrews chapter 4, if you read it, it says we can go before God's throne and find grace and mercy. 
I don't know if you recognize this in your life. He gives us grace and mercy spiritually. I mean, get the salvation is a gift. It, it's a free gift by just saying, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. And he gives you a free gift. I mean, he gives us mercy all the time. I mean, you are here this morning because God gives you the blessing of having breath in your lungs and have good health to be able to come to church. That's a blessing of grace and mercy. I mean, the rhetoric of the enemy will say, what has God given you? He doesn't give you anything. He gives us freely all things. Grace and mercy. He proves his love. And then number three, he takes away all guilt and shame of the past. Because, because he says in verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That's Christians. It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? See, it's God that justifies us in his presence. That means that in his presence, we are totally justified. There's no guilt, no shame. He takes away all of it. And I'm happy about that. Because if, when I look at my past, you know, I got saved. I received Christ as my Savior at age 16. But then for the next 10 years after that, I lived the life of a prodigal son. For the next 10 years. I mean, I, I just... I mean, let the good times roll, and I did. I mean, I, I was just party and have a good time, and, you know, thoughts of God was not in my brain at all. I mean, I just, you know, had a good time. And I can look back on all those things, and I can just, I can just have guilt and shame because of everything I did. Even after that, even at age 26, I gave my life to the Lord, you know, rededicated my life to the Lord. Even after that, I've made a lot of mistakes. I still do make, make mistakes in my life. And I can look at all those things and say, man, I feel so guilty and I feel so shameful. I mean, if I didn't have a place where I could actually like unload all the guilt and shame, I wouldn't be before you up here to this morning. I would be at home just kind of like slumped down, just, man, just feel so guilty and shameful. No, he wants to take all the guilt all the shame. And, and this is what freedom is really all about. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, says, when the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And this is what true freedom is. When you actually let him take all the guilt and shame off of your conscience, because Jesus, he took all your guilt and shame on the cross. And so we, when you hand it over to him, that is true freedom. So, so he proves he's on our side by taking all of our guilt and shame. You know, the rhetoric, rhetoric of the enemy would say, you deserve all that guilt and shame. Look at what you did in the past. Look at all the mistakes that you made. Look at people that you hurt in the past. The enemy would say, you need to bear that guilt and shame. You deserve it. You don't deserve God's love. That's the rhetoric, rhetoric of the enemy. But God says, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. I took all the guilt and shame off of that person. They don't have to carry that anymore. And this proves God's love for us. It proves he's on our side. And then number four, Christ suffered and died to pay for our sin. So he says in verse 34, who, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Christ who died. Now, Christ didn't die like dying his sleep die, you know, just... I'm dead. No, he suffered a horrible, torturous death. That's what he did to prove that he's on our side. Let me just kind of, even before he went to the cross, let me kind of describe to you just a little bit of what Jesus went through. Now, if, you, if you've seen the movie uh, Passion of Christ, has anybody seen that in the room? Yeah, quite a few have seen that. I recommend to watch that because it really shows uh, depicts, you know, what Jesus really went through. And even before he went to the cross, uh, you know, Pilate, he sent him to be whipped. And so what they would do in those days, they would, they would tie like a prisoner to like a post up here, and, and they, they would wrap them around a post just like this and stretch their back out so that they could whip their back. And so they had a whip, and at the end of the, 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 this leather whip, they would have glass and lead to just rip the flesh of the prisoner. 
And so that's what they did to Jesus. And what they would do is they would whip them like actually 39 times. And so they, they said, you know, 40 was the number of judgment to them. And, and so 39 was mercy. Gee, thanks. <laughs> you know, and so they would whip them 39 times. And each time that they would like whip the per- prisoner, they would have them call out like a crime they committed. And as they would call out, as they would whip the prisoner and they would call out the crime, the next, the next lashing would be lighter. And so each time the prisoner would cry out a crime they committed, it would get lighter and lighter until the very whip number 39, they would be just be barely laying it on the prisoner's back. Just imagine, Jesus, the Bible says he had no sin. He had no sin to confess. So each time when they whipped Jesus, it was at full force. He had no sin to confess. And so by the time he got done, he had to been, you know, close to dead. I mean, Jesus died. He, tor- he was tortured. Like This was before he spent six hours on the cross. He did this to prove he is on our side. That he loved, this is the proof of his love. You know, the rhetoric of the enemy would say, he did, what has he done for you? What has Jesus done for you? He died for you. He was tortured for you. And if you go back in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, it says, by his stripes, we are healed. That means each time he got a lashing, wow. That was for our healing, the healing of our sin. Each time, by his stripes, we are healed. That's the proof of his love. I mean, that's the proof that he is on our side. And then number five, you can probably guess this one, the next one. Christ rose from the grave to give us new life. Because he says right after that, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. So that's, that's what we're celebrating today, Easter. He is risen. And not everyone, you know, back in biblical time, not, not all the disciples believed that, that he was going to rise from the grave. Even though Jesus told all the disciples several times, hey guys, I'm going to die, I'm going to torture, I'm gonna, but I'm going to raise from the grave on the third day. But yet, when the day came, it's like the disciples moping around. And he's gone. No, he, he is risen. Jesus came among them, uh, all the disciples except for Thomas one, one day, and, and he had to prove, you know, it's me. It's, it's really me. But Thomas wasn't there. And so Thomas kind of gets a bad rap, you know, doubting Thomas is what we call him. And, uh, but it wasn't just doubting Thomas, it was doubting disciples. None of them believed. And, uh, but Thomas comes in, or Thomas says, you know, all the disciples try to tell him, Jesus is risen. We saw him. He's, Thomas says, except I put my finger prints in, in his hands and I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. That's what doubting Thomas says. So about a week later, Jesus, he shows up in the room again. And he says, Thomas, here I am. Put your fingers right there. Put your hand right there. It's me. And Thomas is like, oh, my God, my Lord. You know, doubting Thomas. And Jesus says, you know, you believe because you've seen me. And Jesus says, blessed are those that don't see me and believe. That's us. We haven't, re- we haven't seen the resurrected Jesus Christ yet. But we are blessed when we believe, we put our faith in the resurrection right now. That's how we're blessed. When we blessed without seeing. See, the rhetoric of the, the enemy would say, why would you believe in some far-fetched, you know, thing like some guy rose from the grave. That's crazy. Who can rise from the grave? That's what the rhetoric of the enemy says. But no, he did rise from the grave. And all of Christianity rests upon this, that he has risen from the grave. He proved he loved us, and he's on our side by giving us new life. If you know him as your Savior this morning, you have the spirit of resurrected life on the inside of you. I mean, he's on your side. And then number six, Christ intercedes before the Father 24-7 for us. 
Because he says, uh, he's for the, furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now we saw last week that the Holy Spirit is on the earth, on the inside of us, actually interceding for us. When we're in our suffering, we don't know what to pray for. The Holy Spirit is actually communicating God's will. Hey, do this in their life. Somehow, supernaturally, he's doing this. Now, it says that we have Jesus Christ up in heaven is interceding for us up there. We have Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ interceding. And he's sitting at the right hand of God. That tells me his blood is interceding for my sin 24-7. There's no accusation. There's no anything that can come against me and Jesus then say, it's paid for. My blood is right here. It's, it's finished. He is interceding for us 24-7. You know, I mean, the rhetoric of the enemy would say, you don't have anybody on your side. I mean, Jesus doesn't care for you. No, he does. He is interceding for you right now, for your sin right now. I mean, he is, he is on your side. And then lastly, number seven, he gives us the promise of his everlasting love. Because the last part of this, uh, starting in verse 35, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's the question. Who is going to do it? Our daddy is bigger than every daddy. What daddy is going to se separate us from the love of Christ? He says, shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. And then he quotes a verse in the Old Testament, verse 36, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us, who loved us. So he says, Who's going to separate us from the love of Christ? Is death, is any kind of suffering that you're going to go through going to separate you from God's love? No. I mean, this is a different perspective on suffering and death. For, for those who follow Jesus, death is actually a win. I mean, when you die, I mean, you, you're going to go straight into the presence of your Savior. That is a win. You're going to experience heaven. I mean, it's a, I know it's a loss, as far as our loved ones are concerned on earth, but it's a win for us if we die. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so just in case you're not totally convinced, the last two verses of the chapter, which I, which I think is kind of like the final fire, fireworks finale of the chapter, you know what he talks about here? Verse 38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, so... When you die, you can't be separated. Anything in life, you can't be separated. Nor angels, that's the bad angels, they can't separate you from God's love. Nor principalities or powers, that's like the government, the powers that be, they can't separate you from God's love. Nor things present, nor things to come. So the present, past, present, and future, nothing there. Uh, nor height, anything up high in the universe or depth, you know, down, down the depths of hell, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's it. Is there, any, is there anything that you can think of that's, that doesn't cover? I think it covered everything. That's everything. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So let me ask you in closing. Do you know that God is on your side? I mean, do you feel that God is on your side? You know, the rhetoric of the enemy is very real. I mean, it's very real in our life. And it comes from a lot of different directions. It may come, you know, from in your life. Maybe you had a bad childhood uh, where, you know, your parents did whatever, you know, to you. There's no perfect parent, but maybe you just had a bad experience of childhood. And because of that, you feel like God is, is not on my side. He doesn't love me. Look at everything I went through. You know, maybe uh, you went through a breakup in a relationship. You know, maybe a marriage or just someone close to, you, close to you and it's a broken relationship and you just feel like forsaken. And because of that, you feel forsaken by God. You know, maybe you're going through some type of physical suffering in your body where 
uh, it's hurt, it's painful, whatever the case may be, and you for, feel forsaken by God. Guess what? There, there's all of these things that we just went through, went through that proves God is for us. He's on our side. Suffering cannot separate us from God's love. You know, one thing that this says in the very end of this chapter, verse 9, uh, 39, it talks about God's everlasting love. But it's connected at the very end of this uh, verse 39 there. It's connected to in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know what that tells me? You cannot be connected to God's everlasting love until you're connected to Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't know him as Savior this morning, you're going to get to the end of your life. And if you have not made that decision yet, you're going to take your last breath. And it is the end of God's love for you in your life. It is the end for all eternity. You are only connected to God's everlasting love through knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Do you know him as Savior this morning? 